Hi, everyone. How's everybody doing? Uh, I just wanted to point out that I think it's interesting that I was going for GraphQL pink, but ended up with Relay Orange over here. So it works in both ways. Uh, my name's Brooks. I am a platform engineer at GitHub, where my team is responsible for our REST API, our webhooks, and as of late, our GraphQL API. And that's what today's talk is about, launching GitHub's public-facing GraphQL API. And so it helps to start with how the GraphQL API came to be at GitHub. Um, just over a year ago, on March 20th of 2016, a proposal was submitted by our VP of Engineering um, in the form of a GitHub issue, as almost everything, every new idea at GitHub is started in the form of a GitHub issue. Um, and what was really interesting about this is that we all had our dreams of the next version of our REST API. We had, we had ideas of all the breaking changes that we wanted to make, all of the, the problems that we've had that inevitably are built up over the years of having any sort of public-facing API. Um, some of the things that really struck out to me and, and to the larger platform team was the idea that you can fetch multiple resources in one round trip. This was revolutionary. This is something that we had all dreamed of. Um, Another was schema introspection. And I know I'm preaching to the choir at this point, but the idea of schema introspection was a totally different, um, a great idea that just didn't map well to the REST endpoints that we had. Um, the ideas of theoretically building documentation for free and automatically, um, programmatically building uh, API clients, uh, like Dan spoke to earlier, these were dreams that we have had for a long time. And as a back-end engineer, like, this is the holy grail. Like, this, you know, just being able to kick up your feet and say, well, cool, yeah, my code can just write more code or documentation, and that's amazing. Um, so about two weeks later, uh, Kyle Daigle, the API engineering manager at GitHub, had a proof of concept done. And what was really incredible about this proof of concept is this wasn't just a greenfield application, just a greenfield proof of concept. This was a proof of concept that existed on top of the GitHub GitHub code base. This was something that was using our models, using our logic, using our databases. And so in this particular example here, this was actually the first query in that proof of concept pull request. Um, we're Rubyists, so we use underscores everywhere. And we now have learned our lesson that that's absolutely not allowed. Um, there's also no pagination, which is something that we had to solve. But nonetheless, the fact that we were able to get a list of our repositories just in a matter of a few weeks really prompted the question, well, if Kyle can do this in two weeks, what could we do in a year, in two years, with this new technology, GraphQL? Uh, before I click the next slide and move on to the next stage of our GraphQL evolution at GitHub, I should, I should asterisk it with, um, there's a catch. But one week later, a new team was created about GraphQL. And the catch was that this was the result of a timely reorganization at GitHub uh, on the engineering team. But the fact that we had a proof of concept done and the fact that we were all so excited about GraphQL is really what propelled us to form this new platform interface team, which is the team that I just introduced myself on, so that we could take GraphQL to the next level. We spent about um, eight months or so before our next big GraphQL milestone. And this was the point in time where we learned all of the things about GraphQL that um, ultimately I'd like to present about in this presentation today. Uh, but eight months later, we launched uh, the public early access release of our GraphQL API. You can think about it as an alpha. Um, and you know, we got, we got press. This, this is a really exciting time for us, but um, we learned a lot along the way. And if you fast forward to today, we're actually running 100 million GraphQL queries a day, which is um, really incredible based on where we were a year ago. Uh, this is still kind of small on GitHub scale, but nonetheless, for our GraphQL API, which is still in alpha, it's really incredible. So we learned some stuff along the way. Um, First off was tooling. So going back to that original proposal, the idea of having automatic documentation was something that we wanted to try and tackle uh, early on. We knew if we were going to be releasing this to the public, it's something that we would have to focus on. Um, my colleague Garin Tarikian wrote this uh, Ruby gem. Um, I really liked from the previous uh, talk the, the idea of a majestic monolith. That's pretty much what I would call GitHub's application. But so we use gems. And so this is a gem, GraphQL Docs, um, which basically allows you to fire off the introspection query. And based on the results of that, put it in this nice, pretty, clean documentation website. Um, 
We knew that our users are comfortable and familiar going to this particular website, and we would have to do something um, in order to make them comfortable and familiar with GraphQL. Now, that being said, um, almost always, if I want to show someone what GraphQL is and teach them what it is, I'll open up Graphical. And within a matter of minutes, someone will just, their, their fingers snap, and they're like, cool, I get it. It makes sense. So it was important for us to embed Graphical inside of our developer website. And the reason is to reduce the amount of friction in order to start using GraphQL at GitHub. If you click that green button, you get uh, an OAuth screen, which figures out all the headers and the authorization and all that stuff so that people can really hit the ground running without having to um, you know, jump through any sort of hoops. And they're using their own data after they click that green button, which is pretty cool. Uh, the next thing that I was talking about in, this, uh, in the original proposal was like, yeah, automatic client generation. That's incredible. That's huge. We've always wanted something like that. And the idea was like, well, we're totally going to have to build a Ruby client. We have OctoKit, which is the library to um, read in the REST API from GitHub in Ruby. And there's a few other languages as well. Um, but the catch was we, we did need a Ruby library, but for reasons other than we originally suspected. Um, we ended up building GraphQL Client. This is uh, something that was uh, built by Josh Peak at GitHub. And basically, the idea is, as Rubyists, we want to be able to exchange a GraphQL query for just nice, pretty Ruby objects that you can call methods on and map that to the fields and the objects and the relation of the graph that comes back. Um, we also co-locate all of our queries, or fragments better, in our views, which is something that's borrowed from the world of JavaScript, as I understand. I am totally a back-end engineer, so co-location was a totally foreign concept to me. But basically, in our Rails views, at the top of each of our Rails views, what we're ending up doing is um, defining fragments and then reusing all of those uh, the, the fields that have been fetched inside of our views. We define our queries inside of our controllers, and then we execute that when the action is, is uh, requested. But we do all of that in Rails, which is really neat. Um, next up was query profiling. Um, as more and more people started to use the schema and to develop schema internal to GitHub as application engineers, we found a need for having to uh, take a look at a particular query and say, well, why is this slow? Where, where could this be going wrong, and where can performance be improved? And so what we ended up doing is tapping into our MySQL instrumentation. Um, again, this is about a year ago. And so the idea is that we're able to see the exact SQL that was executed for a given GraphQL query. This is something like um, what Apollo Optics does very well now. Um, but the idea of having to dive in and take a look at what the underlying implementation is and see how that's executing was very powerful and very well needed for us. One of the next things that we learned along the way was authorization. Um, we're reusing the OAuth logic from our REST API. Um, the, the general idea is that scopes are granted to a particular token. So when a user logs in through um, any sort of external application to GitHub, you get the OAuth window that pops up, and it asks you what sort of information would you be willing to share with this third-party company, for example. And so these scopes represent the different permission levels in which you're allowed to, be, to grant to a particular token. Like, yes, I'm willing to give up my private repositories or my public repositories of the organizations that I belong to. And then that token is used to make a request. This, this flow is something that's familiar to our users. And early on, it was less for us to build, less authorization. And we can reuse a lot of the same authentication that we have pre-existing in the GitHub code base. This is an example of how we're able to pull that off. So this is Ruby. We're using the GraphQL Ruby gem. Shout out, shout out to Robert Masalgo, who built that and really was able to get us um, to the point from zero to proof of concept very quickly. But the general idea is that we can define the name of this particular object. And what we do is we annotate our schema definitions with various different things that are important to us. So accepted scopes, these are the scopes for an OAuth token that were allowed uh, for a particular object. And this is throughout our schema definitions. Now what's cool is in GraphQL, you can actually analyze the query before any sort of resolution happens. So for example, if you take this incoming query, someone's making a request to the API, you can take a look at that. You can parse the AST, and you can say, OK, cool. This user is looking uh, for a particular organization, the GitHub organization. And you can match that with the schema definition to see 
okay, what sort of scopes are necessary in order to see this particular thing? And so right off the bat, what you can do is check against the token and the scopes that have been granted for that token versus the query that they're requesting. And to be frank, this is something that you can probably pull off with a REST API as well. But what's really interesting is that no longer are your scopes bound to entire RESTful resources. They can be bound to things like fields and things that may be sensitive, like uh, your email address, for example, but not the entire user object. And so this isn't perfect. Um, in some cases, you actually have to perform the resolution first in order to determine what the appropriate scope is. The perfect example for us is repo versus public repo. Repo is a scope where, it's, where a user comes along and says, I'm willing to give you access to all of my repositories, whether public or private. Whereas public is, I'll give you access, but just my public repositories. And so what we've done is introduced a layer of authorization on top of the resolution using the middleware uh, that was mentioned in the previous talk, um, basically to check after the fact, OK, we have the repository. Is it private or is it public? And then determine the appropriate scopes. One of the next big sections of what we learned was in schema design. So first of all, there's more than one schema at GitHub. There's one schema for new and sensitive features, and there's another for everyone else. So there's the public schema, and then there's the schema that may be things that we never are willing to expose, for example, like a password or billing information or something like that. We never want to expose that in our public schema. Um, and also, there may be new features that are under development. That also would stay in the internal schema. And similarly, to the way that we're defining our accepted scopes and annotating our schema definitions in Ruby, we do the same thing with this visibility argument. And so we have something like public here for organization, but for this um, cool new feature that we want to release, we may want to keep that back until we're absolutely ready to release it to the wild. Another important thing as we, as we developed our public API was mandatory first and last arguments on connections. Uh, generally, so for example, with this query, uh, we, you must pass last or first. And the general idea behind this is we wanted to motivate our users to have to think about how much data they're going to be getting back. Because the first time that you play with GraphQL, it's like, cool, I can get all the information I ever could have imagined. And while we're not unwilling to give you all of the information that you would like, we need to make sure that we can still do it in a performant and optimal way. Um, another aspect of uh, schema design is in Boolean fields, for example. We want to make sure that we keep some sort of structure to all of our Boolean fields. Uh, we ask that they all start with is, has, or can. So for example, while fetching the repository, you have something like is fork, has issues enabled, and viewer can administer. And so this is just some sort of technique that we would like to use to make sure that as more and more people develop schema at GitHub, uh, that we follow some sort of structure. Uh, another one is avoiding fields that should actually probably be types. It's very easy to bind your GraphQL implementation to the underlying implementation in, say, Rails or in your database. So for example, rather than doing something like owner login, um, we try and make sure that we always uh, follow the ways of the graph. Owner should be its own type, which has its own fields. And so divorcing yourself from the implementation details, you can use GraphQL as a facade, as the perfect, uh, the perfect design that you've always wanted to do but never could because it wasn't implemented that way. And for one of the, um, the last big learnings that we had was in regards to what I call schema-driven development, which I think is the first lightning talk coming up next, so stay tuned. Um, but I should start by talking about how feature development worked at GitHub with our REST API. So usually what would happen is the feature um, is, is developed by an application engineer from the start, and it's built into the UI. Once it's built into the UI, it's staff shipped. Because we're GitHubers using GitHub to build GitHub, um, we basically uh, we get to see all the features first. And once something has been okayed and we're ready and everyone agrees that this is the right way forward, then we release it. Then we get press. So take, for example, the projects feature that launched last year at GitHub Universe. Um, that particular feature, uh, the UI would have been built and then staff shipped and then released. Now, after we've released it, that's when we go back and we build out our REST API.
We take the time, it's usually in a matter of weeks, and we build a corresponding REST API that matches the UI that was just released. This is after the ship. But with GraphQL, all new features are built with it from the start. That means that we build out our schemas first. Um, we build them typically with the visibility of internal. And then once we've done that, um, you build the UI on top of your GraphQL schema. And when we're ready to release this and staff ship it and release it to the wild, it's as simple as flipping a bit, or in Ruby, a symbol. We're, we go from the internal schema to the public schema. And what this allows us to do is to build a true public API. But better than just a public API, it allows us to build a true platform, something that's shared not only between the engineers at GitHub, but also our integrators and our users. Everyone is sharing this same sort of fundamental layer. Um, and we're just basically building the resolvers behind it. That being said, change is scary. Um, you know, it's, uh, it's a big change from REST as an integrator. As someone who builds your business on top of GraphQL, it can be a big change going from REST to GraphQL. And so what we're trying to do is ease our way into it. And one of the ways that we're doing that is with GraphQL-backed REST APIs. The general idea is that um, Projects, actually, was one of the first APIs, or the first features that was truly built from the GraphQL from the beginning. Um, and we decided, as we were developing this, we realized that all the information is already in GraphQL. Cool, we can release that through GraphQL, but people are still familiar, and we're still in alpha. We can't just ask them to use GraphQL, so we need to build the REST APIs as well. So behind the scenes, when you hit the Projects API and a, a number of other APIs, what's actually happening is they're executing a GraphQL query, we're taking the response, and we're massaging it all together to make it look like a RESTful resource. And so this works great for new features like Projects, where it's built from the beginning like that. But what about legacy features? Well, this is one particular um, endpoint that we're trying to bring up to speed. I've spent the last few months on this. Um, this is the slash user endpoint. It tells you information about the currently authenticated user. It tells you things like how many public repositories I have, private repositories, the plan that I have, uh, my name, my email address. And this is very valuable as you're building an integration for GitHub. Um, what we wanted to do, what we sought out to do, is to back this with GraphQL. But this is one of our most frequented endpoints at GitHub. So it was important that we didn't break this. We absolutely had no room for error. Um, but we wanted to make sure that we could throw something um, as highly trafficked as slash user uh, behind GraphQL and make sure that everything still worked great. So the way that we did this was with Scientist. So this is a, a, a Ruby gem. There, it also exists in other languages. But the general idea of Scientist is that you execute multiple code paths. Um, in one code path, we have something called the control. The control, in this case, would be the legacy code path of slash user. We want to execute active record um, API calls, or active record SQL calls, um, and formulate the response. And that's what's re returned to the user. But we also want to execute this new GraphQL path. We want to execute these GraphQL queries. We want to massage that into a RESTful resource structure. And what's interesting about Scientist is no matter what, even if this, the GraphQL query, we call this the candidate, um, even if the candidate explodes, no matter what, the control is what's always returned to the user. So what happens is you have both of these code paths being executed. And what you can do is, after the fact, compare the two. You can measure data discrepancies between the two different things. Um, there were an incredible amount between GraphQL and our REST API. And what actually turned out happening was the REST API almost always was wrong. We were doing it correctly in GraphQL, but it took us having to measure how would you do this in GraphQL versus how would you do this in the REST API in order to see that there were bugs in the REST API. It also allows you to measure a difference in performance. Um, in this particular uh, graph, you can see me slightly uh, turning up the number of actors who are using or participating in this experiment. And the idea is that you want to make sure that the red line on the bottom stays on the bottom. Otherwise, as you increase the number of people participating in this experiment, you'll be able to see the discrepancies in data. 
And so this was a really incredible, powerful tool for us to roll out a change in our public API without anyone ever realizing it. Um, to finish up, I just wanted to talk about generally where we're headed. Um, these are mostly just ideas. None of these are solidified in stone. Some are actually uh, active endeavors of ours. Uh, one is static analysis of schema review um, during our code review. So having a robot um, come and say, like, actually, this is a Boolean field. We like to have that prefixed with is, has, or can. Um, uh, it can also can cover a variety of different things. But being able to catch this, as the more people, the more engineers who build schema at GitHub and at other companies, um, it's really valuable to make sure that there's a, a similar structure in your API. And you can't always catch that. And so what we'd like to do is make sure that we have static analysis throughout an entire uh, code review process. Another is rate limiting. Uh, shout out to Garrett, who's in the office here, who's been working or <laughs> in the audience here on rate limiting. Um, we're still trying to tweak and find the right balance of how much information we can give up. Um, because this is a major uh, difference between our REST API and our GraphQL API, the amount of data that you can get back is just astronomically more. And so we want to make sure that we can still do that in a performant way. Uh, this was an, an incredible idea that came up uh, from a member of the audience in one of our earlier developer conferences at GitHub, but exposing your global node IDs in your REST API. Um, so the idea that you can have globally unique identifiers, if you can expose those in your REST API, it makes it very easy to go from REST to GraphQL because you can just take that same object and still have a way of identifying it. And one idea... Um, that uh, we'd like to borrow from the current version of the REST API is this concept of previews. So if you've ever used the GitHub API, uh, and when we release a new feature, or more specifically, a new endpoint, the way that it works is usually we'll roll that out with a special preview. And in order to opt into that preview, you must pass a special header. The idea is that you're opting into this preview. We'd like to do this with the GraphQL API as well, because more commonly than not, we'd like to share the public uh, schema with you, but we're not quite sure that it's exactly how we would like it. So we would like the flexibility to change it if we ever want to within a certain period of time. So say for the first three months, a new field or a new object is introduced under preview, and say you have to pass some special directive or something like that. Um, we haven't figured everything out. We're still working on stuff. Um, if any of this stuff interests you, we are hiring. Please reach out to me either on Slack, I'm at Brooks on the GraphCool Slack, or at B. Swinnerton on Twitter and GitHub. Thank you. Do you want any questions? Sure. All right. Uh, Oleg is going to set up for the lightning talk, during which we do have time for a couple of questions for Brooks, if anyone has one. We're going to turn off the lights and take a nap, apparently, too. Here. Hey. Hi. The preview fields. Yeah. So one of the main concepts of uh, GraphQL is that you mutate your API. You don't kind of like version it. Sure. So are you going to try to draw a line and say, this isn't a version. This is just a field that we don't want to bring out? Yeah, we, we want to avoid versions at all costs. But instead of having to um, deprecate fields or go from like renaming one to the next, um, we, we would generally like the flexibility of having to do that for a certain period of time. Um, and then once the schema is solidified, then, then everything is great. But um, it's really interesting, especially at GitHub Scale, to see how users use things before actually committing to them. And with the GraphQL API, there may be a missing object there. There may be a missing field. And, and generally speaking, that's, that's what we look for. More questions for Brooks? We do have time. Yes, meet me. Uh, hey, what was the reason to support um, Relay in the GitHub API? You have oftentimes the, like the simple sorry, and the, the, the connection API. Uh, I'm sorry. What was, the, what was the main reason to support the connection API with nodes and edges in, in the GitHub oh, API okay. and not just a simple API? Sure, I mean, um, the the feedback that we've received from our integrators um, in the REST API is that you know, it can be very painful to stitch together multiple REST responses. Um, 
what we've actually done is we have, uh, not only can you do like a single node lookup in the GraphQL API, but you can do like a nodes and pass it a variety of globally unique identifiers. It's basically just a way that um, consumers can get as much information as they would like with the least amount of friction. And coming from a, I mean, I wouldn't say that we have a strictly RESTful API, but it's, we, we try and strive towards that with the best UX as we can. And so we're, we're basically just toying around with that, of being able to fetch all the information as you can with nodes and pass a variety of different global identifiers. All right, we'll have one more question before the lightning talks. Thank you. Uh, so I've been playing around with the GitHub API. It looks really good. Um, could you talk a little bit about the whole uh, nodes and edges thing? Sure. And uh, what are the trade-offs of having those, and why do you have them? Sure, yeah. So uh, it's taken from Relay. And the reason that we do that um, is, uh, so in Rails, we have things like uh, join models, or a join table, essentially, joining two different models. We found that edges work very well to describe the relationship between two models. Uh, at least in our implementation. It also really helps with pagination. So, uh, with, uh, so on the connection, you could ask for the entire total count. But for each of the edges, I mean, right now it's pretty simple in that you just ask for node and uh, the cursor. But theoretically, you could, make an, you could design an edge that describes an entire relationship between two different nodes. I think we do that in a few, in a few cases. And that's generally the direction that we would like to go through. Um, but yeah, it's a concept from, from Relay that we borrowed. Relay the spec. Okay, thank you very much. Cool, thank you. All right.